the lion and the mouse. One hot afternoon, Lion lay snoozing happily in the shade of a tree. Suddenly, he felt something running over his nose. He opened one eye and saw it was a tiny mouse. Furious at being woken, he waited his moment. <laughs> then he flushed out his great paw and caught Mouse by the tail. I, oh, please, squeaked Mouse. I didn't mean to wake you. Please, let me go. I'll pay you back one day, I promise. Lion roared with laughter. You repay me, a little tiddly thing like you. How could such a puny creature be of any use to a king of the beasts like me? Please, great king, cried Mouse. D d don't eat me. Lion yawned and thought about it. He was too sleepy. <laughs> Oh, well, if you insist. After all, you wouldn't make much of a meal, would you? Off you go, and be careful whose nose you walk on in the future. It was not long after that Mouse and Lion met again. This is how it happened. Lion had gone off hunting at dusk. He was stalking through the trees, following a herd of zebra, when he happened to spring a hunter's trap. A great net came down on him and held him fast. <gasps> He roared and raged, but in spite of all his great strength, he could not break free. His roaring echoed through the forest so that everyone heard him, and everyone knew that Lion was in trouble. Mouse heard him too, and he was a mouse of his word. Off he went, as fast as his little legs would carry him to see if he could help. It wasn't long before he came across Lion, still caught up in the net, still roaring and raging. D don't worry, said Mouse. I'll soon have you out of that. And he began to gnaw at the net ropes, one by one, until at last... Lion could break free. There you are, said Mouse. I told you I'd pay you back, didn't I? A little tiddly thing like you, helping out a king of the beasts like me, Lion replied. Who'd have thought it possible? Everything is possible, said Mouse. Goodbye, Lion. And off he scampered, away into the long grass. 
The hare and the tortoise. One day in March, after a morning of carefree cavorting and capering with her friends on the hillside, Hare was hairing her way home along a path when she came across Tortoise. Tortoise was going the same way, but slowly, very slowly, as tortoises do. Hare stopped to tease him. Can't you go a little faster? I mean, how do you ever arrive? Oh, I arrive, said Tortoise very politely. I always arrive, and sooner rather than later, maybe sooner than you imagine. True, said Fox, who was passing by. I'm telling you. As tortoises go, this is a very speedy tortoise. Speedy tortoise? <laughs> scoffed Hare. No such thing. Listen, Hare, said Tortoise, losing his patience a little. I get where I want fast enough, thank you. I'll prove it if you like. How about a race? You and me. The first one to the river is the winner. Hare leaped with laughter, keeping her distance from Fox, of course. A race? You and me? <laughs> no problem. I'll beat you easy peasy. You won't see me for dust. You set us off, Fox. I'm ready. And Fox agreed. Ready, steady, go, Fox called out. And off they went, hair as fast as the wind, and Tortoise, well, Tortoise as slow as a tortoise. But Hare raced away, and was very soon out of sight. So when she next looked behind her, Tortoise was nowhere to be seen. Hare thought to herself, There's no point in showing off if no one's watching. I'll just lie down here in the sun and have a nap, and wait until Tortoise comes. No worries. And before she knew it, she was very fast asleep. Meanwhile, Tortoise just kept plodding on, slowly, steadily, until at last he came to where Hare lay sleeping on the grass. And he thought to himself with a smile, Hare looks tired out with all that running, <laughs> poor old thing, best not to wake her. On Tortoise went, slowly, steadily, up the hills and down the dales toward the river. Just then, a fly landed on Hare's nose. She woke with a start and at once remembered the race. She hared over the fields as fast as she could go. But it was too late. By the time she reached the river bank, Tortoise was already drinking. Oh, what kept you, Hare? he asked. But Hare walked off in a huff far too angry with herself to reply. And Fox 
laughed himself silly all the way home. The Dog and His Bone A dog was waiting outside the butcher's shop one day, as he often did, looking as hang-dog and sad as he could. As usual, the butcher soon saw him, took pity on him. Oh, look at you. Here you go. And threw him a bone. Off the dog trotted, happy as could be, his tail wagging as he went, thinking of where he would bury the bone and how good it would taste after a week or two. As he neared his home, he had to cross a little footbridge over a stream. He was padding across when he stopped to look down at the water, because he was rather thirsty. He was trying to work out how he could keep hold of the bone in his mouth and have a drink at the same time, when he noticed another dog gazing back up at him out of the water. A bigger dog, who had a much bigger bone in his mouth than he had. That's not fair, he thought. His bone's bigger than mine, and I want it. Oh. With that, he jumped into the river and made a grab for the other dog's bone. But to do that... He had to drop his own first. Only then, as he saw his bones sinking to the bottom of the river, did he realise the mistake he had made, how silly he had been. There had been no other dog, no other bone, only his own reflection in the water. He clambered out of the river, shook himself dry, and walked off home, his tail between his legs, feeling very stupid and very annoyed with himself. The Crow and the Jug It was bone dry in the countryside. There had been no rain for weeks on end now. For all the animals and birds it had been a terrible time. To find even a drop of water to drink was almost impossible for them. But the crow, being the cleverest of birds, always managed to find just enough water to keep himself alive. One morning, as he flew over a cottage, he saw a jug standing nearby. The crow knew, of course, that jugs were for water, and as he flew down, he could smell the water inside. He landed and hopped closer to have a look. And sure enough, there was some water at the bottom. Not much, maybe, 
but a little water was a lot better than no water at all. The crow stuck his head into the jug to drink, but his beak, long though it was, would not reach far enough down no matter how hard he pushed. He tried and he tried, but it was no good. However, he knew that one way or another he had to drink that water. He stood there by the jug, wondering what he was going to do. Then he saw pebbles lying on the ground nearby, and that gave him a brilliant idea. One by one, he picked them up and dropped them into the jug. As each pebble fell to the bottom, the water in the jug rose higher, then higher, and higher, until the crow had dropped so many pebbles in that the water was overflowing. Now he could drink and drink his fill. What a clever crow, he thought as he drank. What a clever crow. Belling the Cat Something had to be done. The farm cat, with his sharp eyes and his sharp claws, had killed off so many mice that those who were left held a crisis meeting to see what, if anything, could be done to stop him. They were all very upset, of course. Kill him! They cried. Squash him! Pull out his claws! Bake him into a pie! We've got to do something! (laughs) He's gonna kill us all! Finally, the chief mouse, who was the oldest mouse too, had had enough. He called the meeting to order. (coughs) Fellow mice! Let us be sensible. We can't kill him, or squash him, or pull out his claws, he said. He's too strong, too big, too cunning. Wherever we go, He's always waiting to pounce. That's our problem. Now, if we knew where he was, then he couldn't creep up on us like he does and surprise us. But try as they did, none of the mice could come up with a plan that would really work until one bright young mouse had a great idea. Um, why don't we... He began. Why don't we wait till the cat's fast asleep? Then we could sneak up on him and tie a bell round his neck. That way we'll always hear him coming and we can run off before he catches us. (laughs) Am I brilliant or what? Yes! They all cried. 
brilliant. That mouse is a genius. Let's do it! Let's do it! Come on, let's do it! He'll never sneak up on us again. When they had all calmed down a little bit, the chief mouse said, That sounds like a fine plan. But there's just one little thing that worries me. Which of you will put the bell around the cat's neck? At this, there was a long silence as everyone looked at everyone else. Hmm, pity said the chief mouse. We'll have to think again, won't we? The Rooster and the Fox It was a lovely summer's evening, with the setting sun glowing gold in the west. For the rooster, it was time to roost. So he flew up into his roosting tree, alongside his hens, and crowed at the sunset as he always did. It was his way of saying, Good night, my hens. Sleep well. Do not worry. I'm here to look after you. He was just about to tuck his head under his wing and go to sleep, when he noticed a fox trotting through the grass below him. The fox lifted his nose and saw the rooster and his hens. He licked his lips. Have you heard the good news, friend? said the fox. What good news? replied the rooster, a little suspicious. It's peace. It's peace at last. All the animals have agreed never to chase each other or eat each other again. We can all be friends. Isn't that wonderful? If you say so, said the rooster, but he was even more suspicious now. It's the happiest day of my life, the fox went on. I just want to hug everyone. Come down, why don't you? Let's celebrate our new friendship. The rooster thought for a while. If what you say is true he said. Then it's the happiest day of my life, too, and... He stretched his neck and looked into the distance. I can't be sure, he went on, but I think I see a couple of dogs coming this way. Hard on your scent. They must have heard the good news, too. In an instant, the fox was off and running. What's the matter? The rooster crowed after him. I thought us animals were all friends now. Maybe, replied the fox. Or maybe they haven't heard about it. I'm not going to hang around to find out. And he was gone. Through the hedge and away. 
their hands cloaked and preened themselves. How clever you are! Oh, how clever you are! <laughs> how clever you are! They cried. Yes, I am, my hens, said the rooster. Cleverer than that crafty old fox, anyway. And he tucked his head under his wing and slept as the last of the sun left the sky. The Travellers and the Bear One summer evening late, two travellers, an older one and a younger one, were walking through a forest. All of a sudden they heard below them a great crashing and a terrible roaring. A huge black bear came lumbering out of the forest. One look was enough. They both ran for their lives. But the bear was running faster than they were. He was catching up to them all the time. Hide! cried the older traveller. We must find somewhere to hide! But they were out of the forest by now and there was nowhere to hide. Suddenly, the younger traveller saw his chance of escape. A single tree by the side of the road. I'm climbing that tree! He cried. Quick as a flash, he shimmied up the tree to safety. But there was no time for his friend to climb up after him, and the bear was coming closer and closer and closer. And the older one had a sudden idea. He remembered hearing once that a bear is not interested in eating dead bodies. He would pretend to be dead. He lay down on the path and stayed quite still. Not even breathing. From the safety of his tree, the younger traveller looked on in horror as the bear poured his friend's stiff body and sniffed and snuffled at his head. After a while, the bear had had enough. He gave him one last lick on his ear and his neck and then just walked off. The younger traveller waited for a while to be sure that the bear wasn't coming back, then climbed down the tree and ran to his friend. Are you all right? he cried. Fine said his friend, sitting up. I thought you were done for, I, I really did, said the younger traveller. Me too, replied the older one. It was funny, said the younger traveller, helping his friend to his feet. But when the bear was sniffing you, it, it, it looked almost as if he were whispering to you. He was, replied the older traveller. He told me I should pick my friends better. That 
Anyone who saves himself first and then abandons you to your fate can't be much of a friend. <laughs> The Wind and the Sun The Wind and the Sun were always squabbling. I can outshine you, said Sun. said Wind. Then a shepherd passed by, wrapped up against the cold in a great cloak. Mm, all right, said Sun. Let's settle this once and for all. Whichever of us can somehow part this shepherd from his cloak is the stronger. Agreed? Easy, said Wind. Watch this. He took a deep breath and blew with all his might. The shepherd felt his cloak whipping about him and just pulled it tighter. The more wind blew, the tighter the shepherd clung on to his cloak, because he wanted to keep warm and did not want to lose it. No matter how hard wind blew, he could not part the shepherd from his cloak. Hmm, my turn, said Sun. Watch this. And with that, she... Hmm, shone down on the shepherd with all her might. Feeling the sudden warmth, the shepherd loosened his cloak. As he walked on, he became hotter and hotter under the burning sun. I can't go on in this heat, he said. So he threw his cloak aside and sat down in the shade of a spreading oak tree. Mm, well, said the sun, 
smiling. Snorted wind. Phew, said the shepherd. It's a glorious summer's day. The Lion and the Fox There once lived a very old lion. So old that his teeth and claws were worn down and blunt with age, and so slow he could no longer chase his prey. So he worked out a cunning plan. Instead of hunting his prey as he had before, he would invite his prey to come to him. And this is how he did it. He told all the animals who passed by his cave that he was sick and likely to die soon, and he'd just like someone to talk to. Several of them, the most foolish, came to visit him, believing themselves to be quite safe. And of course... <coughs> he gobbled them up. One day, a fox came along. A wily fox. He kept a safe distance from the cave. I heard you were sick, he said. What's the matter? Come a little closer, said the lion, and I'll tell you, I'm so weak these days, I can only talk in a whisper. But the fox was not so stupid. Um, I think I'll stay where I am, he said. You see, uh, I've noticed that there are Dozens of footprints going into your cave, and, strangely enough, there are none coming out. I wonder why that is. See ya! The Goose That Laid the Golden Eggs There was once a young farmer who had only one dream. He wanted to get as rich as he could as quickly as he could. One morning, he went out as usual to fetch an egg from his goose for breakfast. He reached in under her warm, soft feathers and found, as he had hoped, one huge egg. But when he looked at it, he was amazed. This was no ordinary white goose egg, it was gold and shining in the sun, and it was so heavy he almost dropped it. It was solid gold, 
Gold. Gold. The young farmer could not believe his luck. His dream had come true. Every day, his wonderful goose laid another golden egg, and every day he became richer. But the young farmer was a man in a hurry. For him, one golden goose egg a day was not enough. I'm getting rich, he thought, but I'm not getting rich quickly enough. All she can lay me is one golden egg a day. I know what I'll do. I'll kill her, said the young farmer suddenly. There's bound to be dozens of golden eggs inside her. That way I'll get really rich, and quickly too. So he took his goose by the neck and killed her. And what did he discover? There wasn't a single golden egg inside her. Not one. What have I done? He cried. Now she is dead and won't lay me any more golden eggs. I am ruined. 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 The Rat and the Elephant There was once a little rat who was very proud of himself. To be honest, he did not have that much to be proud of at all, because he was a rat, and we all know what rats are like. Anyway, one day this proud little rat was scurrying along from one farm to another, looking for more grain to steal, when he saw a huge procession coming up the road. There were trumpets sounding, Drums beating, cymbals clashing. The rat knew very well who this must be. It was the king and all his retinue of courtiers. He could see the king now, riding high on a huge elephant. The elephant was adorned with glowing gold and glittering jewels. And with the king, high in his royal howder, there were the king's dog and the king's cat. Dozens of people stood at the roadside in awe of the sumptuous beauty of the king's elephant, gasping in admiration as he passed by. As the rat came closer, no one in the crowd even noticed he was there. So entranced were they by the magnificence and splendour of the king's elephant. The rat was most upset. If there was one thing he hated, it was being ignored. His pride was hurt. Nincompoops! He cried. You're a bunch of ignorant nincompoops! What is the matter with you? Is it because the king's elephant is so big and lumpy and clumsy that you admire him so? Or is it because of his plodding feet? Or his weepy eyes? Or his wrinkly old hide? Look at me! I've got four legs like him, haven't I? Two ears, two eyes. So I'm just as important as he is, aren't I? 
Look at me! Just then, the king's cat did look at him, and he did not like rats, not one bit. He sprang down off the howder and was after the cat, chasing him along the ditch until... Well, I won't tell you exactly what happened. You'll just have to imagine it. One thing's for sure, though. The proud little rat found out he was not quite as important as he thought he was. The Heron and the Fish One day, a heron was out fishing in his favourite stretch of river. He stood there still as a statue, his long, sharp bill ready to stab at tasty fish. All around his legs, the fish swarmed, not even noticing him. The heron waited and waited. These fish aren't big enough for me, he said. I'll wait until a big one comes along. So he waited and waited, and still there were plenty of fish, but always too small. I don't want a snack. I want a proper meal thought the heron, so he waited even longer. <whistles> Suddenly, all the fish left the shallows and moved away, out into the deep water in the middle of the river. Now there were no fish for the heron to catch, not even small ones. Oh, drat! He said to himself, I shouldn't have waited so long. And all he had for his breakfast was snail. A tiny green snail. The oak tree and the river reeds. There once stood a giant oak tree, its great branches shading the silver river beneath it. Along the river's edge was a bank of reeds. Whenever the wind blew, the reeds hung their heads and sang a sad song. The giant oak tree felt sorry for them. I am so lucky, he said. When the wind blows, I just rustle my leaves and sing a happy tune. I know no storm could ever bend me as it bends you. Just then, the reeds began to tremble. A storm was coming in from the north. By nightfall, the storm had become a raging hurricane. The great oak was not afraid. He stood strong against it. Below, 
The reeds were bent almost to the ground. Soon the ground was soaked with rain, and the roots of the great oak tree began to loosen. His leaves became wet and heavy. Still, he did not bend. Then, there was one mighty gust of wind. Up came the roots, and over went the great oak tree, crashing down into the river. When the storm had passed, the reeds were still there, singing their sad song. A lament for the great oak tree, who lay like a fallen warrior, his battle lost. The Miller, His Son, and the Donkey One morning, an old miller and his son set out for market. With them went their donkey, which they were hoping to sell that day. They went along slowly, driving the donkey instead of riding her, because the miller and his son knew they'd have a much better chance of selling her if she didn't look too tired. But as they went on their way they met up with some friends, who laughed at them as they went by. Ha <laughs> will you look at that? Why are you walking when one of you could perfectly well ride? <laughs> How stupid can you get? The miller was a proud man, and did not like to be laughed at. Oh, all right, he told his son. You ride, and I'll walk. So his son climbed up on the donkey, and off they went again. They hadn't gone far when they came upon some travellers resting by the side of the road. Oh, well you look at that, they cried. A young man like you, riding while your poor old father walks? Disgraceful! Have you no respect? Get down, young fellow, and let the old man ride. The miller hated arguments of any kind. A good idea, he said. Get down, son, and let me ride. And so they went on their way to market. As they neared town, they passed by some women, washing clothes in a stream. <gasps> Will you look at that? They cried. That poor boy has to walk while that old fellow has a nice easy ride. Shame on you, old man. You should let him ride up with you. Um, if you say so, sighed the miller, not wanting to upset them. Up you get, son. We'll ride together. 
So now, as they came into town, they were both riding together on the donkey. He was looking rather tired and fed up by this time. The moment the townsfolk saw them coming, they ran out to protest. Oh, will you look at that? They cried. You should be ashamed of yourselves, loading up a poor old donkey like that. She's tired out, poor old thing. Both of you look pretty strong and fit instead of just sitting there weighing her down. You should get off and carry her. I hadn't thought of that, said the miller. We'll, we'll give it a try. They tied the donkey's feet to a pole, hoisted her up, and off they went, carrying the donkey between them, slung on the pole. But when the market traders saw them, Hey! <laughs> what are you doing? They laughed and guffawed and jeered. <laughs> What a couple of donkeys. The donkey did not like being carried at all, and she didn't like being laughed at either. So she began to struggle and kick and bray. <coughs> she kicked so hard the pole snapped and the ropes broke. Once free and back on her feet, she ran off into the crowd and escaped. No matter how hard the old miller and his son looked for the donkey, they never found her again. The Fox and the crow. Out hunting one morning, Fox lifted his nose in the air and smelled something he liked. Something he liked a lot. Cheese, he said, and licked his lips. And off he went, following where his nose led him. Suddenly he saw just what he was looking for. There was Crow, sitting on the branch of an old oak tree. And in her beak was a great chunk of cheese. Delicious, thought Fox, his mouth watering, and just perfect for my breakfast. But how do I get it? And then he had an idea. Good morning, Crow, he said. You beautiful, gorgeous creature. But Crow wasn't that stupid. She knew what Fox was up to. She wouldn't say a word. She would keep her cheese clamped securely in her beak. She knew the game. Fox just sat there, gazing up at her. I have never in all my life set eyes on such a bird as you. Beside you, a peacock looks like a sparrow. You are indeed a bird of paradise. The gloss of your feathers, your delicate head, your charming eyes, your pretty little feet. Perfect in every detail. A veritable wonder of creation. Crow was listening to this from high on her branch and loving every word she was hearing. Though I wonder, Fox said, can any creature be that wonderful? If you could sing beautifully too, then you would indeed be the queen of all the birds. But, 
he went on. It's too much to hope for. Not even you could be that perfect. Oh no, thought Crow. I'll show you, Fox. I'll show you how beautifully I can sing. Listen to this. And she opened her beak to sing. Crows can't sing, of course, but they can caw, and they can croak. As she cawed and she croaked, the cheese fell out of her beak and down, straight into Fox's waiting mouth. Fox caught it and swallowed it up at once. Licking his lips afterward, Fox smiled upward at Crow, who was hopping up and down on her branch in fury. Ah, 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 ah. Cool it, Crow, Fox said. Ugly, you can't help. But how did you get to be that stupid? And off he trotted to look for another breakfast. Because, for a fox, two breakfasts are always better than one. The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse Town Mouse decided one day that he would visit his cousin, who lived way out in the countryside. Country Mouse greeted him warmly, and sat him down to a great feast of corn, and hazelnuts, and berries. Help yourself, she said. You've come a long way, and must be very hungry. Town Mouse didn't much like this plain country food, but he did not want to upset Country Mouse. So he nibbled a little bit here and a little bit there, and said how nice it was. After lunch, Country Mouse proudly showed Town Mouse over the fields and woods around her home. Town Mouse thought it very dull and ordinary, but he did not say so. Instead, he talked all the while about how much fun it was to live in the town, how exciting it was, and how you could eat any food you wanted. As he talked, Country Mouse listened, thinking to herself how wonderful it must be to live in the town. All night long as she slept in her snug little nest in the hedgerow, Country Mouse dreamed of life in the big town. Next morning, Town Mouse was still bragging about how much better it was to live in the town. You should come home with me, he said. I'll show you things you've never even dreamed of. But Country Mouse had dreamed of them, and she wanted to find out if her dreams were true. I'll come with you, 
she said. And off they went to town that very day. At first, it was even better than how Country Mouse had dreamed. Town Mouse clearly lived in great style, exactly as he had said. When they arrived at Town Mouse's house, lunch had just finished, and there were plenty of leftovers on the table. Lots of scrumptious cheese and yummy cakes and succulent jellies. Help yourself, said Town Mouse. Country Mouse thought she had come to Mouse Heaven. Oh, this is the life for me, she said. But just as she said this, the house cat sprang up onto the table and came skittering after them. In and out of the dishes they went, the cat close behind. Follow me! cried Town Mouse as they ran for their lives. And they only just made it too, darting down the tablecloth and running helter-skelter across the carpet toward the mouse house in the baseboard. It was some time before even Town Mouse dared to venture out of the hall again. Still, Country Mouse did not want to leave. She was terrified. It'll be fine now, said Town Mouse. The cat's gone. Don't worry. So, Country Mouse followed Town Mouse across the carpet, hoping against hope that he was right, that the cat would not be waiting to pounce on them again. The cat didn't come back. But the dog did. He came bounding after them, hackles up, barking his head off, sending them both scampering back to their hole for safety. He frightened them both so much that neither dared to come out again until the following morning. That's it, said Country Mouse. I'm off. You may have all the goodies a mouse could ever want in your townhouse. But I'm going back to the country. For the quiet life. The Wolf and the Shepherd's Son The shepherd thought his son was old enough now to guard sheep all by himself. So one morning he sent his son off with the flock into the hills. What if a wolf comes along? The boy asked. Just give us a shout, his father replied, and we'll come and frighten him off. Day after day the shepherd's son watched over his father's sheep. The days were hot and long. Nothing ever seemed to happen, and the boy became very bored and fed up. So he thought he'd make something happen, just for fun. Leaving his sheep, he ran over the hill, 
waving his arms and shouting as loud as he could. Wolf! Wolf! Just as he had hoped, all the villagers, his father among them, stopped everything they were doing and came running with their sticks to drive away the wolf. But of course, as they soon discovered, there was no wolf. Ha 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 ha! Fooled ye! <laughs> Fooled ye! Laughed the shepherd's son. But neither his father nor the villagers thought it was very funny at all. What a nuisance! Some days later, the shepherd's son played the same trick again. Wolf! Wolf! He cried at the top of his voice, and again all the villagers came running. Fooled you! <laughs> Fooled you! He laughed. But no one else was laughing. You need to give up with that, lad. And his father was very angry indeed. The next day, as the shepherd's son sat watching his sheep, he really did see a wolf slinking toward the sheep through the long grass. He leaped to his feet at once and ran over the hill, shouting as loud as he could, Wolf! Wolf! But neither his father nor the villagers came, because none of them believed him. Not this time. He tricked us once, he tricked us twice, his father said. He'll not trick us a third time. There is no wolf. He's just playing games. Help, father! Please help! Cried the shepherd's son as the wolf came slinking closer. There really is a wolf! But no one would listen to him. Meanwhile... The wolf attacked the flock and killed all the sheep he could. And the shepherd's son, too. The fox and the grapes. One hot summer's day, a fox was strolling through an orchard, till he came to a bunch of grapes just ripening on a vine which had been trained over a lofty branch. Just the thing to quench my thirst, quoth he. Drawing back a few paces, he took a run and a jump, and just missed the bunch. Turning round again, with a one, two, three, he jumped up, but with no greater success. Again and again he tried after the tempting morsel, but at last, had to give it up, and walked away with his nose in the air, saying, I am sure they are quite sour. The Ants and the Grasshopper One bright day in late autumn, a family of ants were bustling about in the warm sunshine, 
drying out the grain they had stored up during the summer. When a starving grasshopper, his fiddle under his arm, came up and humbly begged for a bite to eat. What? cried the ants in surprise. Haven't you stored anything away for the winter? What in the world were you doing all last summer? I didn't have time to store up any food, whined the grasshopper. I was so busy making music that before I knew it, the summer was gone. The ants shrugged their shoulders in disgust. Making music, were you? They cried. Very well, now dance. And they turned their backs on the grasshopper and went on with their work. The Wolf in Sheep's Clothing A certain wolf could not get enough to eat because of the watchfulness of the shepherds. But one night he found a sheepskin that had been cast aside and forgotten. The next day, dressed in the skin, the wolf strolled into the pasture with the sheep. Soon, a little lamb was following him about, and was quickly led away to slaughter. That evening, the wolf entered the fold with the flock. But it happened that the shepherd took a fancy for mutton broth that very evening and, picking up a knife, went to the fold. There, the first he laid hands on and killed was the wolf. The Gnat and the Bull On the horn of a bullock alighted a gnat, to which it is likely you'll say, what of that? I'll tell you, this insect thought he was so great that the beast must be weary with bearing his weight. I'm afraid that my pressure disturbs you, said he. You must feel much oppressed by a person like me. But if for five minutes you'll let me remain, I'll remove to some tree which my weight can sustain. Sit still and be quiet, I pray, said the beast. Your weight does not burden my neck in the least. Indeed, I knew not of your coming, and so shall not miss you when ere you think proper to go. Go.